you're one of the most successful executives that we've ever worked with <clears throat> in terms of your ability to kind of transform uh, a culture. What were the key elements to doing that <clears throat> before the pandemic? And then to think through, you know, how can we best uh, realize that same dynamic, that same energy, that same magic in a digital world. So it's all about getting the most talented, high energy, you know, highly motivated, goal-oriented people. It's way more important than the business model, the industry, or anything else. It, the CEOs, the leaders in business that are the most successful, think about their employment brand. Mm -hmm. They manage that brand. It's all related to the culture that they create. And if in fact it puts them in an advantageous position where the most talented people want to come work for you mm -hmm. versus somebody else, everything else gets easier. What have you learned about how effective leaders have kind of juggled those two pieces? So they're reacting in the moment, but they're doing that with one eye on the future. What are some of the things you've learned from that? So you can address the things you need to address now, but in order to stay nimble and to be an employer of, cho of choice, you have to think down the road. So 10 years, 20 years, what do we think things are going to look like? And yes, you still have to get the business of the organization done, but I think folks, at least what I'm seeing is senior leaders understand that, hey, we have to make time for this. This is our role. Our um, We're accountable to the organization, mm -hmm. to our employees, and we have to be more nimble. And for us to do that, we have to see all the possibilities that are out there. As a leader and as leaders in our organization, we've had to learn that we are responsible for the whole office, the whole space uh, for that organizational safety and well-being. Because I think that our leaders thought that this was going to be a short-term pandemic, that in a month or two, we're going back to normal. So they were allowing things to happen in that first month or two or three that they thought they would be able to put a stop to. And so now they're learning what 15, 16, 17 months later, they need to have a paradigm shift that they have to figure out how to be in this virtual environment and this in this remote environment for the long run for how are they going to manage this hybrid workforce and bring everybody together? The pandemic did force many organizations to uh, to move a little bit more quickly uh, to adopt uh, remote working or expand it in some ways that I'm sure they didn't expect or anticipate. And so, while while many who are unaccustomed to telework and remote working, I think will you know, continue to struggle for a while with that concept. You know, we do believe that the recognition that company culture is not dependent on your proximity to your coworkers is a perspective that is probably long overdue. And, and we think it's actually, you know, pretty encouraging to note that the variation we see across cultures, across performance in organizations, um, seems to have very little to do with the physical proximity of people's co-workers. Uh, we've certainly seen primarily virtual organizations, virtual teams that really excelled at the work that they do. They had strong connections among their team members. They were unified around a common mission and purpose. They had shared goals. They could establish effective working norms. Uh, all the things that we know that contribute to a high performing group. Uh, and then we've seen organizations and teams where people were physically co-located and they really struggled to perform across any level um, in spite of that physical proximity. And so you know, I think we've concluded long before COVID-19 that kind of the what you do together, uh, how you do it together is much more important than where you do it from. Essentially, we are seeing managers, thanks to the pandemic, become a little bit narrower, become more task focused, ahead of people focused, a little bit more inwardly or introspectively uh, oriented. You know, we, we went from a world with monitoring and controlling in the, you know, in the Tayloristic years to a world of coaching and supporting. But 
as we move into an online world, you know, I, ideally we will be in the quadrant D of that of that matrix where we're we are inspiring and enabling people by giving them space to learn and develop online. But there is absolutely a possibility that we can almost like fall back into what, what I'm calling a contracting and renewing structure. So I do think that, that we, we have a risk that this blinkered boss syndrome is going to perpetuate unless we work quite hard to avoid it. I mean, we all read about what's happening. And right now, certainly in North America and in Europe, it's all about returning to the workplace in some sort of hybrid uh, way. And you read about some organizations, you know, JP Morgan or whatever, Goldman, who are forcing people back 100% and others which have gone to the other extreme. And, you know, like most people, I can see that some sort of middle ground is the right thing. But, but of course, it's more, it's more subtle than that because, first of all, you've got to be very clear what, you know, what the middle ground looks like because there's, right. there's many ways of structuring a hybrid workplace. And, and I think the onus now lies with employers. And when I say yes. employers, I, I really do mean at the, the level of you know, the person overseeing a particular unit because I don't think you can do this at a kind of macro corporate level. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, the onus lies with the boss of that unit to make it worth people's while to come to work, right? What, what are those things which we genuinely need to be involved in? And you call this the three C's, collaboration, culture, um, and and, cli and clients, I guess, customers. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got to unpack that further and to say, you know, that's that's great, but what, is, what does it mean to show up for culture? You've got to then start thinking about the activities which you're going to put in place you know, that actually help to reinforce it and, 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 and and grow the culture. This will be the most significant reinvention of work in our experience. You know, we've been so fundamentally disrupted. And when the rug is pulled out from under us, we are thinking much more consciously about our work, why we work, what we do, with whom we work, where we work, who we work for. Like, it's just very much part of our consciousness, part of our um, thinking process that's been brought to the surface. And that is causing a shift in employee expectations. It's causing a shift in implications for leadership. It's causing a shift in the way we think about employee experience and the responsibilities that we have as leaders and organizations. The other thing I think is fascinating is that we have seen a fundamental severing of loyalty to jobs, employers, and regions. Like in other downturns and then in other upturns, you typically see an increase in loyalty toward jobs people are holding fast or toward employers that don't want to lose anything or toward regions. But there's been this fundamental severing, a shift in the choices that we're making, a shift in how we prioritize. As we talk about hybrid, our popular press tends to put, you know, kind of this false dichotomy in front of us. It's an either or, home is best, no, no, office is best. And really the magic of hybrid is that it is a both and. And there'll be things that we want to do more um, from home or from remote locations, There'll be things that we want to do in the office. There are reasons that we love working from home or remote locations. There are reasons we love working from the office. And really navigating that both and navigating those choices is our opportunity. Leaders have to take every opportunity to connect with the teams that are on their front line. Um, we've got to be thinking of that, you know, first and foremost, uh, every day. Um, and rethink in this environment what best motivates your people that are on the front line, because that's what's going to determine the success of your organization in the future. End of the day, the labor market's going to win. Um, sorry if this is, you know, uh, not the news you wanted to hear. Um, people voting with their feet, um, moving quickly. Um, and uh, I haven't seen, um, good research on just what part of the great resignation is fueled by people you know leaving jobs that don't offer flexible working arrangements that don't offer the, uh, the opportunities uh that, that they're looking for um but everything's you know in play a lot of the great resignation 
is, um, is kind of facilitated because um, there are a lot of people reaching out, helping organizations recruit, uh, helping them build the team of the future. And there's a lot of people moving to new jobs. And it's really um, challenging because the pull of all of these opportunities are occurring at the same time that the bond to their current organization has, uh, has weakened. And so that, that leaves everybody in your organization, um, you know, particularly vulnerable and quite important that we're actively planning how we're going to retain people. And the only way to do that is that we create a culture and a system that is a magnet that we're very clear about why people are motivated to stay, what our work environment can uh, provide and what's the unique employee value proposition that our organizations create that can help us to be the winner in the labor market. And so labor market strategy becomes a key part of business strategy. Many organizations stepped up and the items that were jumping up the most and the items that were strongest in 2021 were often those that referred to keeping people informed and communicating. When there's so much uncertainty and, and you can't necessarily tell people, here's what life is gonna look like in a week or two weeks or a month, at least you can tell them, here's what we're thinking about, here are the decisions that we're making and the information we're using to make those decisions. In addition to that, adaptability and involvement were those two areas that were more important than ever to enable that flexibility within the organization. Uh, the disruption of the pandemic meant that many organizations had to switch the way they, they worked. Uh, and, and what's important now is organizations have to be capturing those learnings from the disruption and designing new ways of working. And then on the involvement side, what skill sets are going to be important? Again, as, as this disruption caused change, uh, there are going to be new skill sets that are going to be important to be rolling out and, and upskilling your employees with. And as these new work models are adopted, it's going to be important to couple that with some capability development, some training. And so those those aspects of the work are, are going to be more important than ever in, in areas that organizations and leadership need to be focusing on. We've had a pretty dramatic disruption here. We went from a time when everybody needed to be in the office, but then bang, overnight, well, everyone needs to be at home. Um, now we're moving back to uh, an era when we have a choice. We have choices about what we do in this setting that we haven't had before. And you find organizations trying to create both the policy that'll drive people back to work and then manage the costs associated with doing that. You know, and it's a labor market factor too. How much of an advantage is it in each person's mind to have a remote job, to have a job that allows choice. Um, because that's what we found over and over again in the studies that we've done on telework and on remote working is that having the choice makes a big difference. 